All right, so I know it's last presentation of the day. I know everybody's tired. I know I am. Uh, so I'll try to keep it light, and hopefully you guys learn something and have fun while doing it. Uh, I'm Alexander Savage. I'm one of the architects on the Oracle Coherence team uh, at Oracle. And I'll be talking about the statelessness, or the lack of it, actually, in the applications that we build, and why do we call things stateless that are actually not. So before I start, I'd like to give you a warning. This topic is very near and dear to my heart, and I can get upset when somebody tells me things are stateless. So there will be some language in the presentation if you're not comfortable with. I suggest you leave. So let's get started. First. Let's see some of the stupid stuff that people say about stateless and why stateless is good. This is one blog post that I found on Rackspace blog, where it goes on and on about how stateless is bad for you, how having state is bad for you, and then gives final word wisdom at the end. It says, bottom line, stateless apps are ideal. server size data database rights are your enemy. If you must save state, save it on the client. Use cookies and AJAX where appropriate. If you follow this rule, you will multiply your scalability. Yeah, you also won't be able to build anything useful. I mean, do you seriously think that people can store things on the client? I mean, do we need server-side state at all? I asked the dude what he thinks, and this is what he said. <laughs> and that's exactly my feeling when I see something like this. I mean, yes. If you don't have state, everything is much simpler. But the reality is we have state that we need to manage. So let's, let, let's look at another example. Services should be stateless. One benefit that you get from this is scalability. You can move expensive operations to a cluster of dedicated machines, and it does not matter which one responds to a particular request, since all of them are independent. Now, this one actually bothers me more, because the first one is so obviously stupid that most people will read it and ignore it. Right? This one seems like a good advice on the surface. But it's horrible. I mean, it makes one big assumption. It makes assumption that whatever you put in that stateless service does not need to talk to anything else. Right? That it actually doesn't have any state. Fortunately, there is some, and you know, that's the reaction to that. I mean, that's, that's what you said. It's like, yeah, that kind of sounds like a good idea, but is it really? And then finally, there are some people who have sense of humor. And this is actually, I put this chick up because Twitter post looks better than the, than the web page. But she actually quoted something that's on what is website. And it says, the internet can be thought of as a stateless system or machine. Most computers, human beings, and elephants are stateful. And I tend to agree with that. And so does he. Right? I mean, I would change it a bit, though. You know, internet is not really stateless. Internet is very stateful. Internet protocol is stateless. HTTP is stateless. And then the second part, most computers, I'd actually say most applications, or all applications, are stateful. So bottom line is HTTP protocol is stateless. But chances are the restful service you're building on top of it is not. And just to give you an example, this is an example of a truly stateless service. So, you know, you, you can build these things. Can you see the screen? Because I can barely see it from here. Can you guys see it in the back? Yeah, I'm not sure if I can do much about it. Uh, is there a way to change the contrast now? So this is a simple calculator service. It's just JaxRS resource that has one simple service method, which is add. It has parameters x and y, and it returns x and y. So yes, this is stateless. It's also not very useful. And if you're doing, if you're building services like this, I need to talk to you afterwards, because you, this is not what people should be running on the server. This can run anywhere. I mean, if, if you, all you need is to run a simple calculation, you can run it on the client, you can run it wherever you want. You don't need a service for that. But this is what we usually call a stateless service. It's a service that goes to some data source. All right, so that, that's usually what we consider to be a stateless service. I mean, you have some kind of, you know, if you build Spring applications, you have what they call DAO. You could call it repository based on what your preference is. So you get something from some backend data store. You change it, and you put it back. Is that really stateless? 
I mean, you're pulling state from somewhere else, modifying it and persisting it or storing it back. And that's not stateless. And does that really scale? I mean, when we say that services like that scale better, is that really true? I don't think it is. And I will do a demo to demonstrate that that's actually the case. So I have this sophisticated lowest testing framework that I did that does these things against database and whatnot. Eh. But we're going to do this very, very low tech way. I need a couple of volunteers here. Can I get some people? I know you're tired. Come on, just stretch your legs a bit. I need four or five people. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Couple more. We need to scale out, guys. Come on. Where's Jason? Jason, get here. All right. So I know your name, Noah. Dennis, nice to meet you. Alex, Jason, Michael. OK, so who wants to be the database? OK, Michael will be the database. You guys are our stateless services. OK, so now forget your name. OK, and every time I ask you what your name is, you have to ask Michael for it. Michael, do you know, do you know their names? Noah. OK. So what's your name? Michael, what's my name? Your name is Jason. My name is Jason. You do it. What's my name? Just what's my, what's my name? Keep it, keep it short. <laughs> what's my name? Your name is Noah. OK, now do it all at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> Should we add more load? <laughs> Thank you, guys. I mean, that, that's the whole point, right? I mean, stateless services, the way we, we, we write them, or the way people usually write them, they only scale as good as the state management layer behind them. And in most cases, that's not all that good. So the big question is, and really the whole point of this presentation, I mean, I'm not here to rant about statelessness, although it does irks me to no end when people talk about it. How do we really build scalable services and application if, if that's the case? I mean, if we're not supposed to use stateless services, what do we do? Well, I guess there are a couple rules that we can follow, right? A couple, couple rules that have proven to work well when building uh, scalable systems. And one is to separate state management and durability aspects of the system. You don't need to manage state in the same thing that you use to persist state or to make sure that the state is durable. Right? You could manage state in memory using a technology that allows you to scale. And in most cases, that implies a technology that allows you to partition data, because partitioning scales. We know that partitioning scales, right? So you can, if you can partition data across many processes, you can scale it out. You can scale both capacity, you can scale throughput out. Right? So to give you some examples without being overly coherence-oriented. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about uh, Lightband Lagom. It's a microservices framework uh, that Lightband released recently. And it's, you know, when I was watching a presentation, Jonas wrote the book, and I strongly, strongly recommend the book on the left. If you're building microservices, it's a really good read. Uh, Lagom itself, I mean, I'm not going to say bad things. Again, I, I respect Jonas. I, I, you know, I like what they're doing. I think we have a lot of opinions that match. But there are some things about Lagom that I don't find that exciting and that I think it's too cumbersome for me to use it personally. But when I was watching their persistence talk, they had this slide. And you know, basically, they're partitioning data. They have friend service. They have three instances of a friend service. They partition data across the cluster, across these instances. And then they write everything back to the Cassandra cluster. Tar target guys, this looks familiar to you? Right? All right so, so when I saw this, I was like, this is a really interesting idea. I wonder where I saw it before. And then I remember, there was this 2007 slide when I saw coherence. I was like, oh yeah, that's the same thing. We partition data across the cluster. And then I look at Ignite documentation. OK, sorry, you can take a picture. <laughs> It's old. We have better slides now. 
And then Ignite does the same thing, right? So we have technologies to make this possible today. You guys are using Hazel Custom, Coherence, Ignite, all of those things are the same thing. They, they allow you to partition data across many machines, keep data in memory. And they all have some way to persist data on the back end, whether it's write through, read through to the database, which pretty much everybody supports, whether it's persistence, which we added to coherence in the re recent release, so you don't actually have to have database, you can just persist data directly to disk from, from the data grid. And, and then important aspect, you know, I, I didn't call it when I said you need to step, separate state management and durability, I didn't say you need to separate state management and persistence, because I think durability and persistence are somewhat different. I mean, you could be durable without necessarily being persistent. In most cases, you will go to disk, but you could also have a federation or data center application. You could, you could say that maybe that's enough durability for you. So if you have everything in memory in a couple different data centers, maybe it's enough. Because again, each cluster itself has backups. Each cluster should be resilient. But if the whole data center fails, you have another data center. So you, know, you have to figure out what, what kind of durability works for you. So the second rule is, and it kind of builds on the previous presentation, and I think on, on the target talk earlier, don't move data unless you have to. You know, send operations to the data instead. And this actually has a couple different aspects. One of them is, again, old ugly slide. One of them is near caching, right? You can bring data to the client so you don't have to go over the network when you're doing reads. Whether you use near caching or continuous query caching or whatever the mechanism is, most of data grid products have the ability to bring data in process for read purposes, right? <clears throat> but then you also need to have the ability to send data, to send operations, to send mutating operations into the cluster to actually make changes to the data without moving data itself over the network. And entry processors are an obvious way to do that. So looking back at our shopping cart example, adding an item to the shopping cart could be as simple as sending, as sending a lambda into the cluster to a shopping cart with a given ID and saying cart, add this item to yourself. And if you think this is <coughs> kind of difficult to do, well, we actually did. I mean, with coherence, you can do it today. This is how implementation for coherence of this particular method would look. And we added support in 12 to 1, we added support for distributed lambdas to coherence. And that also solves one of the problems you guys mentioned which is how do you upgrade entry processors. We will take this Lambda from the client, ship it to the server, and define it there. You don't have to deploy your entry processor ahead of time. We will actually take it from the client and ship it into a cluster when we see it, when we can capture it as a Lambda. So that's, that's one way to, <coughs> to do it, right? One thing that will help with scalability. The other thing is do whatever you can asynchronously. If you're doing if you're loading data and if you're simply doing put, 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 put synchronously, it's going to take some time. Every put is blocking operation. You have to go over the network. You have to go do a backup, get a, get a response back. Whether something comes in the response or doesn't is irrelevant. You're blocking until that whole operation completes. It's a long operation. Your client could be doing a lot more, right? So one aspect is how do you code it, right? And I'll get into that second. But the but first thing is at the architecture level is... REST truly the best when it comes to microservices in particular. Is that the best API you should use? I mean, REST is HTTP and REST are inherently synchronous. Even if you do them asynchronously, you're still blocking your TCP connection. You're still tying up TCP connections. So you cannot really make them truly asynchronous. I mean, you have things out there like Socket.io and gRPC that allow you to do a truly asynchronous communication between services, right? So evaluate options that you have out there. You know, just, just because REST and HTTP are what everybody talks about doesn't mean they're the best solution for you. And then <coughs> at the application level, as I said, you could do things synchronously in a blocking fashion, or you could do them asynchronously. Again, we added async API to coherence in 12 to 1, and, and we got some really amazing results. Everything, I mean, we, one thing we tried to do in 12 to 1, just, you know, is we, we tried to adopt as many Java 8 features as we could. I mean, everything is targeted for Java 8, runs on Java 8 only, and uses Java features wherever we can. So we have distributed lambdas, we have distributed streams. We also added async API that relies on a completable future. So every operation on a name cache API, like we have our old synchronous API, but now we have equivalent async name cache API that we, where, where each method returns a completable future. So you can do composition of things, right? So you can say cache async.get, 
And then when that is complete, you say, then apply this function to the result, right? And you can compose. I mean, completable future is really an awesome addition to Java 8, and, and one of the things people don't talk nearly enough about as, as they should. I mean, it's one of the probably most powerful features that was added to Java 8 after Lambdas. We also added support for distributed c streams. It uses our standard aggregation features under the hood, but you can use Java 8 stream API and do basically aggregation in parallel across coherence cluster. Once we released, uh, this is something we just announced recently, we also released Coherence RX as an open source project. So if you're doing RX Java, if you're doing reactive programming and you need to access data, we also have similar API to our async API that instead of completable futures, returns RX Java observable. So you can easily consume coherence for RX Java applications. So rule number four, uh, and this, this comes down to how do we avoid distributed transactions? Because while distributed transactions can come in handy and might be necessary in some cases, you should really try as hard as you can to avoid them. Uh, because if you can avoid them, you can scale much better. Because there is no, no way around it. I mean, once you go down the distributed transactions route, you're going to limit your scalability. So if you care about scaling, you should avoid them. And one way, probably the best way that I found to avoid them is to model your complex business processes as state machines. So each entry that you put in a cache, for example, order entry, is a state machine. And it goes to a bunch of different states. Right? So it could go through paid state processing, send, whatever. I mean, it, it moves through different states. And, and whenever it's in a particular state, it is safe. It is guarded in a cluster. It, you know, if anything falls over, it will move somewhere else, and the processing will continue. So you use the fact. You know, whenever you see these events on a back end, whenever the order comes in, you check what state it is in, and you basically continue processing it from there. So you can implement fairly sophisticated event-driven state machine-based systems if you model your domain correctly. And rule five is don't use global logs, counters, or other stupid shit that prevents you from scaling out. And this, this one, really came out recently. I was forced to do some things with that CD and, and, and Zookeeper, and I looked at it, and it's just, how do these guys invent to scale? I mean, this, this thing cannot possibly scale. Mongo is better now. Mongo used to have this global write lock issue. I mean, they're much better now, but I mean, why would you even begin with something like that? Etcd and Zookeeper have this notion of a global counter. So every time you do mutating operation anywhere in the tree, in the whole instance, you have to increment this counter. It's like, wh why? Why? I mean, it's just, you know, you can shoot yourself in the foot very easily if you don't think about what you're doing. I mean, global counters, locks, those things will prevent you from scaling. So avoid them as much as you can, as these guys say. You can't be serious, man. You cannot be serious. Don't use them. So. Another thing that will help you, I didn't put it as a rule, it's not really a rule, but it's strongly recommended. Become familiar with domain-driven design. These two books, first one in particular, is basically what introduces domain-driven design and teaches you how to model your domain in a way that works very, very well within memory data grids. Uh, you need to think about things as aggregates. You don't want to break things up as if you were writing application against relational database. Uh, the second one actually goes into a lot more detail how to do certain things, and it's a useful read, but it's, it, it, you know, what I don't like about it is that it is focused very much on how to make domain-driven design work with the relational database. There is, there is some material on how to make it work with in-memory grids and key value stores, but for the most part, big part of the book goes about, it talks about relational database. But still, I think they're both, they're both very valuable read, because that, you know, you do need to understand how to model things properly so you can apply some of these, these concepts, right? Because you, you want to have your entries, you want to have your cache aggregates in the data grid to be your units of atomicity. I mean, if you can work at the entry level or even at the partition level, you can have transactions, you know, obviously you can, have trans you all, you can always have transaction on, on an entry. You can have local transaction on a partition when you have a set of related entries that are collocated. But these books will help you understand how to actually model those things properly. So now I assume there are some of you who don't necessarily agree with the things that I said. I feel pretty much this way. So I'll, I'll open the floor for questions and, and let you guys out of here, hopefully sooner, sooner than we were supposed to. Any questions?
Yes. We don't. We have class loader that loads lambdas. We ship, we ship the code, we ship the bytecode for the whole lambda into the grid from the client. So it will capture lambda. We don't, you know, we, we found limitation. We started, started with Java, lambda serialization, but that was very limited. I mean, because what, what Java does is they actually just send metadata about the lambda. So they expect the same thing that we used to expect. They expect the class to exist on both sides, right? So, so, so they need to have class that captures lambda both on the client and on the server. They also only support Java serialization. We, we have different, I mean, we actually recommend different serialization mechanism, you know, portable, portable objects, POF, uh, and that's what mo most customers use. So we had to come up with, with Lambda serialization solution that would actually allow us to use any serialization format. And then we also realized that making the requirement they impose, right, that, that you have to have both classes make it pretty much impossible to upgrade because you, cannot, you have to upgrade clients and servers in a lockstep because if you do anything else, you're basically, you have the same issue as if you had anonymous classes. You, there, is no, there is no guarantee that the Lambda on the new client will match the Lambda on the old server or, or vice versa, right? So when we started thinking about that, we realized that the only way to actually solve it is to take the Lambda, take the bytecode for the Lambda from the client <laughs> basically implement the class that implements Lambda interface, functional interface, take the bytecode for the class, send it to the server. Uh, we use uh, MD5 to basically guarantee uniqueness of the class based on, based on the content and whatnot. So you can keep, keep track of that. And then define class on the server and execute it. Right? So we can actually take, I mean, we cannot, you cannot take everything from the client, but if you know, reasonable Lambdas, reasonable code from the client, we can actually take it and ship it to the server and redefine it there and execute it. Yes. Same thing. I mean, if you look at, let me go back to that slide. If you look at this example, you can see that the second argument is a lambda, right? I'm calling that process method on my DAO object that is a lambda. That lambda is actually not coherence entry processor, right? On the next slide, I actually have implementation of coherence entry processor that is lambda itself as well. And it takes that remote function that I'm passing from the client, it takes it as, as an argument. So that's basically a captured argument, right? So it uses it as a captured argument, we package everything, all the captured arguments, we package them you know, with the bytecode, send them, create an instance of it with those arguments and then execute it on the server. Yes? Yeah, I mean, at, at the moment, what, what you know, we discussed, we, we, we did talk about that a lot. I mean, obviously, you have to trust your client. We have different ways uh, to ensure that only clients that are allowed to connect to a cluster can actually connect to a cluster, so you can always leverage that. You can also enable, if you, you know, if you enable Java security, there is very limited it's very limited what this Lambda can actually do. It can basically access entry and, and change the entry. That's about it. It cannot call system exit when it gets to the cluster, right? So if, if you enable Java security, because it's in a very, you know, it's, it's in a protection domain that has no security privileges, right? But then you can, you know, if you don't want to use, because, you know, obviously Java security comes with a performance cost, right? If you don't want to use it and most customers don't, then you basically need to control who can, uh, who can talk to you. Right? Who, who is allowed to talk to you as a client, right? Any other questions? All right. Thank you, guys.